I'm Larry Metcalf. My journey for my life has been discovering who I am through my art. I am a maker. I am a teacher. I'm an advocate. I am who I am. And I have discovered every year who I am or who I want to be or who I should be. My youth to my middle age, and then finally to my elderly age. I have discovered that I am a maker and I have enjoyed making all my life. You might quote, put the quote in quotation an artist, but I always like to consider myself a maker, a person who is manipulating materials and learning about a variety of materials and uh, techniques, whether it be fiber, ceramics, metals, collaging, painting, or drawing. My earlier works in terms of making was doing work. My work, looms were not set up at that time. So I was work influenced by my Norwegian grandmother because she was very involved in textiles, especially crochet and stitching. So I, and I was concerned with fetish forms, and I did a lot of needle weaving. Fetish forms had a spiritual quality to them. They had a native quality to them. They, sp they spoke to a, a, a primitive kind of a, approach. And I began to work with needle weaving using a variety of natural materials, mostly for the first part was wool. And then I would add feathers. And then I formed, my loom became the sticks as I needle wove. And then I began to move them into sculptural forms because I could pull them together. But I also was interested in doing wall pieces. And uh, always was I interested in using natural materials in most of my art, as you'll see as I move along. And I began to work large. I started smaller in my fetishes and began to work larger and began to add uh, other materials, but I began to become more texturally involved. And with the knots that I learned how to use the Giardi's knot and I could do the knotting and the, the yarn could be left hanging. And so I began to like that kind of texture. I have always been involved with texture in my life, whether it was visually two dimension, whether it was third to texture was always important how something felt. I always liked to feel things. So my hands were important. And I began to discover like I did through my grandmother as she would sit, I began to with a ball of yarn and a line would go and she'd have a hook and she would loop and loop and loop and crochet. And the crochets would be flat, but could go into different shapes and the shapes would be added to shapes. And most of the concepts that she had were utilitarian. They were to be beautiful, but they were to be used in the house as coverlets for the most part or bedspreads. I wasn't concerned about more, more, so much the utilitarian approach. It's what I could do to crochet and manipulate to uh, work them into form rather than shapes. So here is a series of fetishes that I and was in conceiving with having to do in the crochet form. In this case was fish. The, the uh, idea of floating, or if it was birds, the idea of flying, being free or being able to float. And uh, I am who I am. I wanted to go in different directions. I wished I could fly. I wished I could float. And so I began to become involved with crocheting and form. And I began to use color as I learned to use color in designing. And a man of war piece is a floating, as a floating section and fish are floating and 
feathers are flying and uh, although feathers could be in water too but it had to do with uh, the idea of sort of a freedom a, a, a way of of being out of myself I was influenced by in art history about the techniques of, that were uh, uh, women's issues having to do with uh, uh, feminist issues. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, whose images were erotic but very very subtle, and she always and two dimensional, and she had an approach with color and the sensual way she interpreted her flowers was very intriguing to me. Interesting because my grandmother was a wonderful, wonderful gardener, and she always introduced me to flowers and the beauty of color and the way, way it works in the garden. And I became intrigued with. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe and her approach to how she worked on her paintings, and especially the way she could blend her colors and softly move them to from one color to the next, or from bright to dull or light to dark. But Judy Chicago also was very important because she did a series that were a unit, but they were more sculptural approach or over feminist issues. And they were more obvious in terms of the approach. So the wedding party was people that were involved in no, this was the dinner party, not the wedding party. They were the individuals involved in the uh, uh, dinner party, and she, it was in, an installation. And I thought at that time, wow, that's really an interesting way to go. A whole theme, sculptural, around individual pieces put together in a unit. Starting out, I, I was asked to contribute to a show that had to do with a Valentine theme. And I began to use the Judy uh, Chicago approach, but this in this time I used applique techniques and did a sculptural approach to applique and did a few stitching on top and began to use natural objects that went around to it. So this is my, uh, actually this is a fetish. And th this fetish has to do uh, with love. It has to do, uh, of, of course, with the Valentine. And Valentine's Day is very much evolved around love, eroticism. It's a sensual kind of an approach to communication. And I moved into that sensual approach. And from there, I begin to move now deciding I would do my own version of a party, and I would call it the wedding party. And I begin to establish individuals that were involved in the wedding, the bride, the groom, the bridesmaids, maid of honor. What is a maid or who is a maid of honor? The groomsman, the best man. Why is he the best man? And then all of the other participants, the mother, the father of the bride and the groom, the groomsman. The, uh, if I began to do a, an installation, a, an installation. I didn't set a table, but I made these sort of, again, fetishes on a pole that you could carry almost in a performance. It becomes a performance kind of thing, a, a theatrical approach to it. And this was my version of the bride, first version of the bride. I had to do a second version of the bride because someone stole the first. So I had the second bride, but I thought that was apropos. It was sort of the way things go in a wedding or a wedding party or a marriage. So uh, the, that approach, but in terms of the uh sensual approaches. I also did a part of the series that had to do with the birth, the birthing series. The birth of mourning, for the most part, is what I was interested in. And this piece was uh, um, the mourning series, and it was a birth. And um, it set me on a road of, to or a, a journey to making a larger pieces that had to do with um, the birth series. And 
I this piece was uh, in a, a show that, and I won an award for the this piece, and I was asked by uh, Virginia Harvey if she could use it on the cover of her uh, new book coming out about the techniques of basketry. And I had used some basketry techniques, but I not in the traditional basketry form, but it had to do with form. And I think that's what she was intrigued by and the techniques of that I used. So I, I was really pleased. With it. I was young when I did this piece, and I it was rather encouraging to me that I had taken on uh, an aspect where I was beginning to reach out of my teaching and moving out into the artistic community. I was young. I was commissioned to do a large piece for our, a theater project at uh, my, my university. And this is another sort of a birth of morning series. A birth, it was a day series, really. It was morning, moving to noon, and then moving to evening. And so it became a, sort of a, a progression of the day, moving to the sunset somewhat. I don't have as many sunset colors in there, but uh, and it was done in three pieces. It's a very large piece. It's, uh, uh, it's about uh, four or five feet uh, by uh, 18 feet, I believe, in three different pieces that I moved in and manipulated in sculpture using woven, some twining, and some knotting techniques. I was very pleased with that, and it is in the entry of, their, of a new theater. I was doing other commissions, and this was a, well, this really isn't a commission. This was a thankful piece for uh, a, a person that had helped me, uh, and I did this for his wife and uh, was very enthused about uh, doing it, and I did it in small parts. Uh, on a, This piece was on a loom, it, and uh, I did some uh, traditional twining, uh, not twining, traditional wrapping. And I did some braiding along with weaving. And I added uh, beads um, to give me some textural changes. A, a, a larger commission I had was for a church of baptistry. Being from a, a, a Baptist uh, approach, I used the theme of the baptistry of water and light. Baptist by immersion is a part of the ceremonial approach to uh, a, a, the Christian Baptist approach. And I grew up in that background. And uh, this is was designed of silver thread wrapped around a, a, a rope and six inches. And then they were all bound together. And the design was based on the beauty of the carving, the sensitivity and the delicacy of the carving so that I install lights so that the light would shimmer off the piece and give light, light and water because there's water in the baptistry and you are buried in the water and rise up out of the water. And this was for me an exciting piece at that time. I also had another commission by a Baptist church, and this was a uh, Black American church, and I worked with the designer, and it was uh, <clears throat> inspired by the architecture of that church, was, which was based on African, uh, some African uh, approaches, and some of the colors on the outside of the church were very African in approach. And so I used a kinte cloth-like feeling, but used a Baptist approach to uh, baptism by water. And I used the symbols uh, of uh, the Holy Spirit. I used the, the flower uh, and the purging of uh, the hyssop flower, the purging and the uh, dew drops or the drops of purging fall into the baptism. And I used the figure as a flat figure, somewhat floating, 
but it, and then I used the the cloth on side. It's a very large piece conceived of three pieces, and it ends in the just above the baptismal water. And it is was really meant to uh, uh, be a piece that's in front of the doorway that leads the person that's being baptized into the baptized into the pool. I was thrilled about this applique piece the size of it and how it could be machined, uh, stitched, embossed uh, was a new direction that I had taken away from the smaller, from the larger woven pieces and uh, the smaller crocheted pieces that I had been working on. I was inspired by this piece as well and intrigued. I also received a very large commission for a science center. It was six feet by 24 feet, all done on a box loom. I can, I made a box loom and that large, and I stretched all of the warp, and then I began to twine. It's all by a twining technique, and it has to do with energy. And the tri triangle forms, it again has the sun. The sun is energy, and I used a variety of different textures. It was wool, some synthetic, and very, very colorful. But it was about energy and about the heavens. And uh, I then finished and stretched. I had another commission by a university that had to do with their ceremony, and it was to be used in their ceremony at the beginning of the session for their students when they come in and in a church. And this had to be a, a ceremonial thing. And I based it on the traditional parts of cross. And it as well is an applique where I used fabric textural fabrics that I was uh, very interested in. And I, um, some were printed, some were woven, and uh, there was a lot of uh, a silver thread involved in it. It's small, but it's a it's a ceremonial flag you carry down the aisle as a, in a procession. And I was it, I was excited about that approach. It was a very different approach in terms of using um, traditional Christian symbols. I did a series of, started doing a series of, well, a thank you for a friend. And this is a chair, a series of ch two chairs, a Mr. and Mrs. chair. You know, there's always a Mr. chair and a Mrs. chair. My grandfather sat in one chair and my grandmother sat in the other. And whether it was at a table or whether it was in the living room, they all had their chair. Both of them had their chair that they sat in. And I used crochet and this is a pillow form two pillows on a chair, chair conceived of willow tied together with raffia. And I made the symbol of the female and I made the symbol of the male, the mister and the missus. And they are have a sense of eroticism to them. And I used uh, silver thread, gold thread, synthetic thread. And uh, actually, I was pleased with these two. I don't know why. I guess all artists are pleased with their, makers are pleased with their work, hopefully at the end. A lot of my work uh, had to, was therapy. And many times when things were said or when I was feeling that I needed to work, uh, do my work as I, or I needed to try and solve a problem, I would use my creation as therapy. This piece is a small little letter to myself, having to do with confined, house confined, or defined within a house of who I am. And oftentimes you're def defined who you are by outsiders, but inside you know who you are. And so uh, this was, a, in a way, me speaking to myself. I'm, def I'm defined I, of who I am 
and uh, that I work it out as therapy. I speak to myself, whether I speak to anyone else, I speak to myself. And I, in a way, that's what a lot of art is about. This has to do with, with a series of, well, it actually is a Adam and Eve. Who is Adam? Who is Eve? And I used uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, the dove in the form. I used this silver uh, feathers that I put silver leaf on. And on one side, I have Adam and the other side, I have Eve. And uh, it, in a way, it was a therapeutic piece as well, but it's a larger piece. And uh, I, I use some of my, in, in this case, I use some of my uh, Christian or religious background to express the Adam and Eve uh, approach to um, speaking about the theme. This one is very interesting because this also was a therapeutic piece. It had a cross vision in it from a religious background, but it has a little bit of eroticism in it. And it was a piece that I made uh, having to a little bit of conflict within myself, but it also was meant to have a round, half round black arc, a peaceful kind of approach to all of the tension that was going on in this piece, crocheted, collage, a buildup, and the black round, the back triangle piece wrapped around a wooden, a little wooden, uh, piece was meant to be curved and it kept breaking on me and breaking on me and I finally decided that's the way it's meant to be it the piece is speaking to me it's come alive and it's saying it's broken leave it it's not meant to be a curve a softness it's not it's meant to be what it is so I let Sometimes you let your artwork speak to you rather than forcing your artwork. You let your artwork evolve because creating is a process. It's a, you and the materials. And sometimes you don't always control the material. You let it speak to you. This was a piece that I... In a way, it's a therapeutic piece as well. It's a piece I did for a show, and it was a shoe show. And I, I, it was somewhat in a collaboration. I had the uh, the brass piece formed uh, by a friend into a heel of the shoe. In my interpretation of what a shoe is, it's a spiked shoe out of paper, wooden dowels. It has smaller dowels that have been uh, gold leafed and it has a few feathers for lightness to it. But I had a copper heart made. What is a heart? It's interesting. A heart has to do with love, but a heart is also sort of an erotic kind of piece. And I use the spike heel because a lot of times the spiked heel is a symbol of aggression or a symbol of uh, uh, not terror, but you you know a sort of a can be a threatening thing. And I put the spiked heel right in the cleavage of the heart, and another way of speaking to myself, but that's what I spoke about. And this is finally uh, a series that I have been working on that has to do with, well, again, more fetishes, a series that uh, of 24 of which I had completed. And uh, they too have a, uh, they're crocheted and they have a, a, a feeling of uh, 
well, natural, I want to move beyond natural, uh, tribal, sort of a tribal interpretation. And I use, again, a lot of texture, crocheted texture, and then beads. And then I twisted large fabrics. I, I braided fabric and I suspended them on a pole, uh, again, like the... Uh, series that I did for the bride, uh, the wedding uh, party, where they would be on poles as part of a ceremony, a little bit different than uh, Judy Chicago's ceremony approach. But these could be used also in as a profession. It brings me back to the professional banner that I made for a university. So here they could be used if I wanted in a performance. Interesting how things that can be static can be used as performance art. And uh, so not that I ever use them that way, but I, they did move in that direction for me. And so these are just a few of the series that I did. And uh, again, texture is important. Tactile texture, visual texture, variety of textures from natural, to man-made, to flat textures that in a painting, to actual textures. And in, in a case, uh, these can move to the erotic approach as well. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to use some uh, erotic kinds of uh, images, nor should anyone be afraid to use it if they're so inclined. But, you know, these are sumptuous pieces for me, colorful, textural. There are smaller pieces. In fact, they go quicker than uh, what uh, the large commissions go because some of the commissions I worked on took two or three years to do. And so then I would have to do, sit down in an armchair and do some smaller pieces to think I'm getting something done while I'm doing a huge piece. Uh, th that's always was a conflict. If I'm doing huge pieces, what am I doing small? And how am I going to show pieces that I'm working on large when it takes two years, but then I have commitments to show out in the public. And so I would do these smaller pieces that and sumptuous, sumptuous. I, I like that word sumptuous. I guess I'm a tactile person. I've always liked to touch. Everyone says, don't touch, don't touch this, don't touch me, don't touch that. I can never understand. I like to touch things. I like to run my hands over. I like to touch the cat. I like to touch the dog. I like the texture. Texture. I think texture is one of the most important parts of my uh, artwork and then adding other textures to it. And whether it be a visual texture, a tactile texture. And these are some of the works that I had been preparing for a, a later exhibition. Whether I'm going to be able to finish the other 12, I'm not too sure, but there's always hope. Uh, there's always hope. And I guess that's what you live by is having hope. In a way, that tends to be a religious philosophy too, isn't it? There's always a hope in life. And whatever that hope is for, you can hope, whether it's an afterlife or whether it's just hope for this life right now. So uh, interesting, I had a, a former student who was having a show and he says, Mr. Metcalf, would you be part of the show with me? I'd like to have a teacher, uh, a, t a student teacher show. And I said, Yes, I would love to. He was a painter and I decided on some work that I was doing because a close friend had died and I was grieving tremendously. And my friend was a paper maker and was a very close friend. And I decided, yes, I will do that. And I did a series of six of these sculptural installations of paper. I didn't make the paper, but he used paper, but I used a heavier 
um, a museum paper that could be cut and folded into forms. And I built out of uh, the form that surrounded it out of uh, willow and they became pagodas. And he, these six, these six that's not, uh, forms had to do with grieving. Each time, each time we we talked, each time um, we touched, each time we communicated. So it was a, a grieving that was very personal for me. He was a very close friend, and I, I needed this time to change my work. And well, I really haven't changed my work, but I, I needed another direction. And in a way, it became th therapy for grieving. And there are many reasons why you create artwork. And one of them is therapy or for grieving. And uh, so I use the same platform of a pedestal. And I uh, used a little bit of color, but I chose to use not a lot of color because I wanted in the installation, again, it's an installation. I wanted to have them on a pedestal and I wanted to have the light specifically play up so it cast shadows. There were shadows cast upon the white forms that were folded forms and uh, a little bit of color natural materials, there's felt, there's wood, there's uh, thread. Uh, it, it worked. It worked as therapy. And uh, I was pleased with the outcome of what this, uh, uh, it, again, it was in another installation. More than just a show. The, these are uh, uh, some a part of the series, the same part of a series that I've been working on uh, for, for their crocheted pieces, and um, part of the t uh, twelve that I have finished for an exhibition of twenty-four. The teacher, you know, it's interesting. I've my grandmother was the teacher for me at a young age. She would, she was, she crocheted, she appliqued, she stitched. She was a gardener, beautiful gardener, wonderful gardener. Her gardens were just beautiful. They were basically flower gardens, but she knew how to put things together. And she would encourage me and influence me. She would enter, she'd take me to her sunroom that overlooked her garden, bring me paper and brushes. And she'd say, Larry, draw what you see. And I would sit there and I would draw. She encouraged me, her Norwegian approach to the arts and the, basically, as I said, her approach was utilitarian, but she knew I had something that I wanted to go beyond that. And she encouraged me. All of my teachers have taught me, but all of my teachers had encouraged me. And that's the in exciting thing I have felt about teaching is encouraging people, whatever talent they have, if they can develop, but encourage it and help to nurture as best you can. So a teacher really is an advocate for you as well. And my high, my elementary teacher, I learned how to create purple in the second grade. She didn't tell me how to do it. She gave me the experience of how to learn how to do it. My fifth grade teacher influenced me on how to create large murals for the classroom. Each month we did a group and work in a group. We would work in a group and create these large murals because we, our classroom was a portable outside of the classroom. Oh, your classroom is a portable. You don't get to be in the other. She created an environment, again, an installation of a room for learning. And I was so excited by making these murals and learning how to 
put water in a big uh, sort of box she had and how to put water in and splash the water in and how to put the fishes in and have the aquarium. It was an experience that I learned. My um, junior high school teacher, I said, I went to him and I said, you know, I want to be a teacher. And I said, you know, I want to be an art teacher. I, I did a lot of music. I did accordion. I sang. I danced. I did all kinds of things. I tried some acting. I did all kinds of artistic things. But I went to my ninth grade teacher and I said, you know, I want to be an art teacher. I said, but what if I'm not a good artist? What if I... He said... You don't have to be a good artist, but you can be a good teacher. It sort of opened up for me the idea that believe in myself, who I am. I can be. So I went on and I went into the visual arts and concentrated quite a bit on visual arts. And my high school teacher was very, both teachers were very important to me. And then I went on to the University of Washington and I concentrated on eventually art education, becoming a teacher, the methods of teaching and uh, the inspiration of teaching, all of the, the parts that are important in teaching. But I also got involved in printmaking as well as a variety, because in art education, you have to have a variety, you know, a variety of materials. You have to have ceramics, metal smithing, you have to have printmaking, you have to have painting, you have to have drawing, you have to have basic design. All of that is involved, especially if you're going to be going into teaching into junior high and high school. And that's where I wanted to go. So I began, I finished my art education program, I, and I was young, and I didn't get my first teaching job. I decided to go on to graduate school, and I went into getting my Master of Fine Arts in printmaking. And I spent uh, a couple of years doing that, having to work at the same time. And, um, and eventually, uh, I uh, got near my thesis, but then, um, my home caught fire and it needed repair and I couldn't continue on my thesis and go to school plus re repair and rebuild my home. But I had at that time achieved a job on the university level and had been hired to do uh, to work with the art education program. So I began to um, have it to do some having to do some drawings and uh, I, because I had to have an exhibition of shows with the other teachers and I began to do a lot of drawing, which I hadn't done a lot of drawing before, but uh, I was able to do that. I tried to do some other prints along with it, but these are uh, some images later on that carried over that carried over into my uh, further production work. My office was always, I thought a creative process. My students would think, oh, it's sort of a messy process. Well, it was messy. It was piles and piles. And piles. It was textural. It was texture on texture on texture. Fabric in the back, drawings in the back, papers on top, grade books and whatever. But it was my life. It was my my own little world where I could discover myself as a teacher, as a maker, and later as an advocate, a person who advocated for the arts. In the meantime, uh, while I was doing this and while I was trying to finish my thesis, I was asked to finish this design work that had been done by a form, the former chair of the art department who moved on, but he said, 
the new building is having this new bell tower and I need, and I have done the design work for it and it's all been done in scale. Can you do and implement and get this done? Because I'm moving on. And I said, I will do it with my students. And so my students and I moved this, scaled this up to this size from a little drawing that was maybe eight inches and we scaled three sides of this bell tower up to the size that you see it here, and then cut out the forms that were to be cast in cement. It was, actually it was my first huge piece that I had to worry about. And it wasn't my piece as such. I was just the maker of it, designed by someone else. But, I was enthralled with doing it. As a professor of art at Seattle Pacific for years, I helped develop the art department, the art education department, especially. That's what I was brought into to Seattle Pacific was to help develop the elementary education, especially. They had a secondary um, uh, education as well, and I moved on that. The enrollment basically was high on the elementary level, uh, but uh, because you didn't always have the art majors that were going into elementary education. So I uh, be uh, became the teacher I wanted to be, and I was able to become some, I was able to be the maker as well as being the teacher. But I, uh, so I, in deciding I needed, in working with elementary teachers, I also needed to be working with elementary children at the same time. So I started the elementary education program outside of classrooms and I, uh, the classroom for teachers, and I would be teaching children on Saturdays and uh, helping um, the prospective elementary teachers be involved in working with the children at that time. It wasn't all theory in the classroom. It was actually being involved with children as they were working with art and the lessons that I was giving them and they were helping to learn. Later on, after I retired, I went into working with elementary children in an after school program uh, with Nancy Lorem. And that was in a way, my capstone of teaching was eventually when I retired, I went back to the elementary classroom, leaving the university classroom and preparing teachers. I came back to my beginning. You sometimes go full circle. And in a way, that's where the circle has no beginning or it has no end. It all ties together. And I think in this case, my life tied together around teaching, being the maker of art. But along the road that you travel to the horizon, you know, one perspective, you keep in one point perspective, you're always heading for that point to the horizon. I always begin to travel that road knowing who I am or who discovering who I am. It's interesting when you travel a road, you look at the scenery and you look around and you begin to enjoy that travel and you begin disco discovering new experiences. And that's what I did. And as ad an advocate, I began to work with allied arts. I began to work with Northwest designer craftsmen. I worked uh, as an advocate for many other organizations, the importance of the arts. I, I worked in presenting the arts to church groups, music, especially uh, music through uh, uh, not actually being the musician that I was in my youth, but actually presenting the arts in a, a religious approach, uh, working with uh, Quincy Jones's mother, Sarah Jones. She, uh, we would uh, go out into the church community, and I, I learned an awful lot from her about the way she, how she felt about 
the church and the arts in the church and, and sharing. I worked with the Bellevue Art Museum. I worked with many art mu other museums and galleries doing advocacies for the work. I also presented much of the, the inst uh, uh, designed many of the installations for these museums. It brought an enrichment to my life that was beyond the classroom. I now was an advocate or possibly a visual teacher for my philosophy of about presenting other people's work. And that, for me, began to bring another circle. It You know, there's concentric circles in your life, and they begin to expand. And I found that from my interest of my grandparent, my grandmother, and my teachers, I began to grow in these circles that became bigger and bigger and bigger. And will the circle be unbroken? No, you keep trying to keep that circle going. And I'll always be thankful for, uh, she wasn't my teacher, but that Hazel Koenig, she was in a way, she was my advocate as well at times, and we were cohorts in doing visual. I taught a lot. I learned a lot from her about placement in sculpture, placement in a, a volume, and how unrelated works could pull together and make themselves a unit, can pull the unit together so that it has a cohesiveness. All the different parts pull together, make a statement, whether it's the parts were by one person or many persons, you need to make a visual statement. And that's all my life. The quilt shows I did for the Bellevue Art Museum, pulling those together. Uh, the actually I curated some shows as well a basketry show not a traditional I, I've always loved basketry of course I'm a textile person and I'm a weaver uh, and I use knotting techniques but I curated a basket show uh, for the Richland Arts Center and put that together one of the first major contemporary basket shows that I did. I've always, as I said, been interested in Native American baskets, but this one, I a lot of my uh, friends and cohorts were making baskets. What is a basket? Yeah, it's a container, but it's form. And it can be out of a variety of materials, new materials, old materials, natural materials, or, or or organic materials, metal materials, whatever. But it, they can speak because basketry in many cases has taken on a, a different form. And in this case, many of the baskets were not utilitarian. They were aesthetic sculptural forms, textures, smooth to rough, open to closed spaces, very, I was, this was a very exciting show for me to put together of uh, people that I knew, people that I didn't know, and uh, curating it, bringing it to my, uh, a vision that I had. So many good friends, my friend Donna Anderson, Bob, um, and uh, actually this is Donna's basket, and uh, it's not really a basket. What is a basket? You know, I guess it's a sculptural form. It can hold something, but maybe it doesn't have to. Why not? Why can't it be something else? Look at one thing and see another. It becomes an exciting kind of interpretation. You don't always want to be doing the same old thing. Always alongside of me helping in many of these installations, was Calvin Kilgore, a good friend of mine, and he knew the direction I would like to take. We were very simpatico in the approaches and the support we gave to one another. I will always appreciate him. I have traveled the show road. I have traveled the teaching road. I have traveled the advocate road, but I have always need some some friends or people, spouses beside myself, 
giving me support. Because my road has been a search of finding who I am. As I have worked with uh, uh, a Northwest designer craftsman years from the beginning, uh, in the early mid 60s, late 60s, I have traveled the road and along the road, I've had friends that have been big supporters. This is friends. Friends are important. They have always been important. The originer, originators of Northwest Designer Craftsman, I, did, I pulled together a show of the people that established Northwest Designer Craftsman. Oh my, I was, that was early. I was a, still a student in uh, the university, maybe even in high school, uh, when this organization of Northwest Designer Craftsman was established in a variety of uh, different craft mediums, what were called traditional craft mediums, and what was called craftsman at this time has now expanded because we have developed a, a, we, a more an inclusive use of the word craftsman. It's now craft artisan or craft person. And uh, th I brought th this show together and uh, these images, uh, I had huge... Uh, well, you wouldn't call them posters, but they were um, images made of the work of those people that um, were the originators from weavers to metalsmiths to uh, 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 ceramic people uh, to furniture makers and designers. So it was uh, an exciting thing. And I always have been with these people, Northwest designer craftsmen, they have been a good part of my professional life. In fact, I don't think I, I could separate my life from my art life to my advocate life, my community life, to my teaching life. My whole life has been involved in many aspects of what the artistic person is about. And who an artistic person is. Hi, it's Lynn, fellow NWDC member. Larry has made a lasting mark on our organization, on the members, because he would sometimes come to a meeting or a social event and remind us that art needed to be in all parts of our lives, not just the art we make. For example, no tin foil plates of food at events. So we have really learned a lot from Larry. Hello, I'm Ron Adams. And I'm Nancy Laura Adams. I've been a member of Northwest Designer Craftsman for over 50 years. Larry was the president when I became a member, and he'd been president for several terms and convinced me that I should become president. He promised to help me with the endeavor. Larry was more committed and more involved in the life of NWDC than anybody that I knew. He was the head of the art department at Seattle Pacific University where we held our meetings. And when there was a show to be organized, work was delivered to the art building. And most often wherever the work went, Larry would be there to hang the show. Larry's participation was essential to the success of NWDC. And now Nancy Lorem Adams is the president and Larry's been very supportive and helpful to her. So thank you, Larry, for your support and dedication. Thank you, Larry. And I thank them for the support that they have given me as well, because you can't do things alone. You need others around you that are there to guide you, help you, and support you. And this I have found with friends. Friends are important to anyone's success. You can't live 
alone. You have to reach out. Whether I'm an angel with a halo, well, that's debatable, but at least uh, you can have a good cup of coffee out of a cup and enjoy, and, and enjoy the coffee or tea or whatever else you might like to combine in that cup. So uh, my life has changed and gone in many, many directions after I retired. I, not, I kept going on as an advocate, but I tended to look at whatever I did as a new creative approach to my life whether I go back to working in an area that was consumed in the, the restaurant business to support my way through university, or whether it was in the design business to support my way through the university or to establish my ex more de development in the universe, uh, in my life. It was always with friends being important to me. And uh, without friends, you can't do it alone. You need friends. And friends have always been important. And I will say that family has always been important to me. As much as they could be, my family, my children. Uh, and in my travels, I have gone in many directions. I have gone, my, my travel hasn't always been one point perspective, but you know, my wife has always been a very huge supporter in the direction that I've taken, the direction I've taken now. She's been there to guide and to help me. And for this, I will always be thankful because she was a spiritual part of my life. And that I will always be thankful for. I am who I am, and I discovered who I am, and I discovered that, you know, I was an illusion for all my life, and I had to let go, or was forced to let go of that illusion. I am who I am, there's a part of my life it is gay. Many would call it happy. Well, I'm not sure it's happy, but it it's an understanding of loving. And it's an understanding of yourself. Who am I? Who am I to others? I'm a friend. I'm a father. I'm a partner. The first noble truth of Buddhism is that life involves suffering, aging, sickness, and loss are inevitable. I've learned that friendship is not only what you can give, but what you can receive. And you know, a lot of people don't know how to receive re friendship. But you know, if you give, you receive. And in a way, That is a religious being. Isn't that a, what 
all religions are based upon? And whatever interpretation you have, you are a person. And my students were people. They were persons. They became friends. And that was an important part of my life. Russell today, to the age of 106, was a part of my life. Artists were a part of my life. Without them, I would be nothing. I enjoyed being with people. I think the hardest part of my life as I'm going through now is not being able to be around people, not being as mobile, not being able to drive. It sort of gets you isolated. So you try other ways. I have been drawing and making cards like I started in the beginning of my life, from my elementary years, drawings, making cards. My drawings, my art became my cards. My cards and notes became my art. My They became my communication. Ron Adams, he and I as elementary children played kick the can in the middle of the street on long summer nights. Support from friends within the Northwest Designer Craftsman. They encouraged me. You don't get anywhere unless you get an encouragement, whether they agree with you or not. Allied Arts, my outside organization, people became friends. Advocate, I was an advocate. But more than that, we were searching all of us were searching for a relationship that's friends. Friends need friends for the most part. And they can be happy. They can be different. They can be whatever they want to be. But if you understand and know who they are and they know who and understand who you are, they can communicate to your life and you can communicate to them. Lars, my goodness, we sit there behind a mask. We've taken the masks off many years ago. But yes, I am who I am. I was an illusion. I have moved on. I am down to the point in my life, sitting in a chair, now to the point where as a person I'm making, and I'm making those cards, and I'm writing those letters. And I've decided as my 10th grade language arts teacher said to me, why don't you, because you're a visual person as well, why don't you draw in the margins of the paper that you give to me? They don't have to be just one way of presentation. You can present your own originality and you can do it with visual images along with the written word. I have never forgotten that. And this has become my signature. My face with my glasses, my hair receding, some eyebrows, and an image coming from my mouth, as well as my written words that I either now type or would have handwritten before. I am who I am. I am no longer in illusion. And I... The journey for me has been discovering. Isn't that what life is about? 
is to discover. It's just not to make. It's not just to teach. It's just not to advocate. But is to realize in that journey You are who you are. You are a person and you realize the words, I am who I am. And I've traveled the journey to discover. <laughs>